I read uh, a little of Defi- uh Let me start that again. Yeah. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> <laughs> the entire episode is a bloopers reel. <laughs> I, I saw The Day of the Jackal. Oh, you watched the movie? I watched the movie. I did. In really? my off time, in my free time, I did. I had to do it in, in two sittings because it is a bit of a long film. It's two and a half hours. What did it's you a, think? Yeah, interesting film. Very, um, very hard-nosed, really hard-nosed film. Um, and it's funny because it's... It sort of has this 007 feel. You've got this, you know, assassin and it, this historical, you know, kill de Gaulle kind of movement, which I didn't, I had no idea that they want, that it was an assassination attempt on, on de Gaulle or that there was an entire movement in France oh, yeah. that wanted him dead because of... He withdrew from Algeria. They were yeah, really that's right. Uh, uh, the paratroopers. Right. Li- liberating Algeria, right? Was it liberating? Or was it well, just that they withdrew? What, they what actually... France Never got understood. out of Algeria. France got out of Algeria and said, we're done. We're not, uh, I'm not sure, but basically he, de Gaulle got France out of Algeria and the, the paratroopers or the, the elite military troops were not amused in any way whatsoever. Right. right. Like Cuba for us. Yeah, it's also sort of like Vietnam. I yeah, mean, I think yeah. I think that probably sort of weighed on. Well, Vietnam also for France. Well, yeah. You know, during Dien Bien Phu had happened, and I think De Gaulle was aware oh. of that and said, y- "You know what?" So was this like a colonial thing where where Algeria was like cheap labor? You know, you go and live like kings. When well, you're, that's where that's where is that where like, Camus grew up? Camus, Camus is from Algeria, exactly. Right. Yeah, I think which it's I, sh- I, I think was always what, curious about, you know, that's because what the plague I, is about. I think that's where it takes place, uh, right? right? And I, right. I I'm, we're probably mangling this horribly, but mm. yes, Day of the like Jackal, everything, like every, <laughs> but even, but we're we're treading on even more tender toes. At that's this true. Point. That's um, true. But yes, there was. Um, if you read the Wikipedia thing about Frederick Forsyth, he was a reporter, and actually, he covered that. He was involved in the reporting on the OAS, which I think was the the organization of the secret army, which were all these dissident um, uh, uh, military people who were pissed off at yeah. De Gaulle for for abandoning them. Um, and pulling out of Algeria, and they wanted re- revenge or yeah. whatever they wanted. So it's based very much in fact. Right, right. I mean, even though this guy, the Jackal, is probably completely fictional, right? There's no record of him historically, I don't, I don't think. Um, I don't know. But, what's, or, yeah. but what I mean, do you think about the feel of the f- I mean, to me, the feel of the film was so interesting. Yeah, what did I call it? A hard, hard, it's like a hard boiled film. It's, it's a, I don't know. It's like, it, it isn't. It's not like quite like a Hong Kong, you know, um, murder film. It, it's um, I'm thinking of like Chow Yun Fat, who's this fantastic actor in these Hong Kong films. But um, it, well, what I found kind of wild was you sort of you're sort of rooting for the jackal, right? Oh yeah, because. He's Wiley e. Coyote. He's he, Wiley. E. He's he's like <laughs> avoiding things. He's planning things very carefully, and he's going to get the job done. and And he's so careful and professional, and all this weird stuff. But then he just starts doing this awful crap, yeah. and you start to hate him. And then you start rooting for the cops to kill him. Right. And um, that's a, that was that was really interesting. I thought, especially for a film of the of its time. I just thought it was really hard edge for for its time. Like but I just it, love the cinematography. I love near the yeah. end. It's all these huge street scenes of Paris. Yeah, I'm not sure and how they did how, that. How they did that, but it's it starts making you think of like you know that gritty streets of like you know uh, the Seven Ups and the French Connection and mm-hmm. all those movies that are being made at the same time, where you have all these like very sort of you know real life. You know, the camera in the streets kind of vibe rather than something that's uh, extensively rehearsed. Um, so there's kind of a mixture of that because you have, you know, you also, but it's, it's not glare. It's not the born identity. It's not high tech. No, it's none of that. It's not mission impossible. It's, it's well, not there's a little bit like the gun maker, you know, there, there's, uh, you know, the kind of gun that he gets made and how he hides it. And, 
you know, they has this idea for this for this rifle, basically this assassin. And I guess because of, I, to a certain degree, we can't really see that movie the way it was seen the first time. Probably when people first saw that, that was like on the level of yeah. the born identity. But now, you know, to us, it just seems almost laughably naive. Um, but well, I it was really, it was coming out with the broccoli films, you know, the 007 films, right around the same around the same time. So it didn't have any fancy like. It had a nice. He had a nice car for a while. And then yeah, he but had it didn't machine it. guns. It didn't. No, the yeah. license plates didn't flip and stuff like that. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was really cool. I thought it was a really fascinating film. Um, I just I love the cinematography. I love the pace of it. Um, you know, with so many of the films today, it's just like everything is so tightly. You know, everything just is so propulsive in the movies and so heavily. It's it's much more relaxed back then. Um, yeah. and the, it's two and a half hour film and it really takes its time to sort of build up to a crescendo. And I love how fast it ends. It's like yeah. the final scene is like, it's like, you know, like 27 seconds long. And right. It's, and also yeah. it's like, okay, that's it. I guess we're and then, done. And then they never figured out who he was. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was interesting too, because I thought it was a, I thought it was a gap in the writing when the jackal says, something like send it, send it to me at my address when he's, when he's first getting hired. Right. There's, you know, in terms of, it, I think it was, was it payment he was going to send or no, he was having the payment wired to a Swiss, Swiss account, Swiss bank account. but yeah. there was some kind of correspondence that was being sent to his address. Huh. And I said, no way, no way does he have an address. You're going to send something to, right. He's the jackal. He's, he's like a top assassin. And it turns out, of course, it was a stolen address. And yeah. with a, at a stolen location, it was actually somebody else. Um, so yeah, I, I, it was it was consistent and and it was really kind of uh, brutal in, in in terms of its uh, portrayal of the main character and and the portrayal of the movement too. You know, I mean, these generals that are that are sort of hiding out from the French government. Um, yeah, they know. And then, and then, you know, and then there's a betrayal uh, in the right. In there's the, torture. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. To, I bet you when it came out, in whatever came out, like seventy two, I bet you is a shocker. I, um, it was a bit of a shocker today. I thought, yeah, um, yeah. but a good film. I thought it just, but a really well made film, um, and moves the plot along. It's it's sort of the DNA for a lot of things that I think came after. I think it's Robert Ludlum. And Frederick Forsyth were the two guys, one of the two main guys who gave rise to this whole genre. Um, I think it was Ludlum who did all the Bourne stuff. Yeah. And Frederick Forsyth did this, um, the Odessa file, the boys mm -hmm. from Brazil, all this stuff. We talked about the last time. Anyway, so I'm glad you enjoyed it. I thought it was a really interesting trip back to a different era. Yeah. 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 Definitely enjoyed. Um, and then I have. Um, uh, started the, uh, I've started the book by, uh, Robert Whitehill. Dead Rise. Dead Rise is the name, is the name of the book. Um, yeah. Um, and it's a, it's got a slow start. So you, you, you need to stick with it. It's, it's not, he's not, um, I mean, he, he drops you in with some, with, with a kind of a, a shock, but the shock doesn't mean anything because you haven't really connected with the main character yet. And a lot of the beginning of the book is connecting with this main character, which I believe is the main character for a number of books that follow. Um, and there is also this very uh, mercurial bad guy that just seems like a goof, kind of a political hang on, uh, hanger on, right? In the beginning, and then you realize is actually kind of a G Gordon Liddy type bad guy. Oh. Um, so interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I'm, I haven't been able to read very quickly. Um, I've been just falling asleep because I've been exhausted because I'm getting up at five. Um, I'm Why doing yoga, but five, I'm getting up in five at five and doing yoga. Okay. Um, and uh, I just, I'm, I've been doing that as an experiment because I thought, um, I had read somewhere that, uh, you know, some people exercise first thing in the morning because the body builds up cortisol uh, when you sleep. And cortisol is a stress drug, stress hormone. So um, if you sweat a little bit in the morning, then you can kind of burn that off. 
Uh-huh. Now, I don't know how accurate that is, but it seemed like a reasonable uh, hypothesis. So I thought I would test it out by getting up before everybody else and then doing yoga first thing in the morning. And I think it, I think it has a good effect. Plus, I'm, getting, I'm doing yoga every morning. I'm not doing a lot. Yeah. I'm just I found that if I, if I get up first thing, and I may do this tomorrow morning, it's getting nice and chilly around here. Um, you get up first thing in the morning, you take a nice walk around the park. Yeah. You know, you get in like a a half mile to a mile walk. I think it helps set the dials a little bit. It helps, it helps sand the edges off a Mm -hmm. little bit. Um, Because the the great thing about exercise is that it's an absolute sense of accomplishment. I did that today. Yeah. There's nothing to argue. It's not like, it's not like work, work where like, I don't know if that HTML code is the, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But at least with, 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 with exercise, it's an absolute achievement. Um, I got my fresh air. I got out. I participated in the world outside. I got some exercise. I got some fresh, you know, all that and kind of walking stuff. does something to the brain, it's, I think. Yeah, you know, well, walking yeah. activates certain thoughts you wouldn't ordinarily have if you're just walking and not also listening to an audio book or a podcast. Um, that, yeah, that is an absolute good. I, I agree. And every time I do it around here, I can't listen to anything. It's it's amazing. I, I say, okay, I should really load a podcast or a book. I'm like, I can't stand to listen to anything anymore. Hmm. I'm really tired of listening to, to people talking. I'm really, yeah, it's really <laughs> speaking weird. of which, yeah. speaking of which, if you'd like to support the podcast, uh, go to yeah. patreon.com slash Jim. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just, for some reason, I just, I don't want to hear, I, I've, I've been listening to stuff for decades and all I want to do is just go out there and walk and just look around and just look at the leaves and look at the water. And I think that, I think it's easy to underestimate the importance of the 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 salutary effect of just a human being looking at nature. Um, mm. Aside from all of the poetic and the transcendental v- values of it, I think there's something good for the brain. I think we're creatures that have been hardwired for a gazillion years to read the landscape and to look at the landscape and to analyze the landscape. And I think if you sit in a room staring at a screen too long, you go a little nutty. And I think it's really good just to go out and stare at a tree for a little while. Um, because I think your eye sort of reacts uh, to that. But anyway, um, no, yeah. I, but I so agree. that's why you're, you're doing yoga at five o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I like, I like the idea of walking, but I'm really enjoying doing this, uh, because it was getting to the point where I was having like hip pain and knee pain. And, and, you know, it's like, nah, I used to do yo- yoga a lot. And I, you know, right now I don't feel like I could do any of it, but you know, I'm just doing a little bit and it's yeah. totally and loosening it. up and it works. Yeah. Yeah. But now you're exhausted. Well, I mean, the thing is I'm getting up at five, so I go to sleep at nine, you know, and yeah. that, pretty much nine sharp. And so reading, you know, until 10 is not always going to work out. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so but, should I read uh, Dead Rise? Do we want to? Yeah, I think it'd be great because okay. uh, I, I think we could have, I think we could have Robert on as a guest okay. um, if we, if we do, I mean, be, it would be, he's got like a lot of books out. So um, if we at least read one, <laughs> we have something to talk about. Yeah. Uh, we can find out more of what's in store for the other books. But it is along the lines of uh, the Day of the Jackal. Applebee's Grill is calling me. That's interesting. Um, it is along the lines of the Day of the Jackal. So, it, it, I mean, it's in that, it's in that milieu. There's the, uh, the whole um, thriller type. Uh, international thriller there is some kind of it's a political i can't right. quite get grasp what's going on but you know there's a sunken ship you know and uh Ooh. yeah yeah there's a macguffin and it's uh a macguffin and it's on it's, it takes place on the chesapeake bay so it's all based around uh robert's uh stomping grounds right so, so it yeah. sounds like we got a heavy dose of the one of the grand days of them all tom clancy yeah, yeah, there's uh, right, and it's stuff I just never read, so that I think that'll be interesting. Well, it's you know, it's interesting. Um, since we have nothing else prepared for this evening, um, I've read, I mean, I read a lot of Tom Clancy, mm. I read Hunt for Red October, Patriot Games, Clear and Present Danger, Some of All Fears, and I probably read one or two other in addition to that. Hunt for Red October is a fabulous book, it's a great book, it's a re- and it's really different from all of his other books 
the, there's also Patriot Games, which is kind of weird, which is about the IRA, and it's a different thing altogether. Right. But Hunt for October is a fabulous book. It's a really good book and a great a, a great opening book. I just never dug – with each book he did after that, I, I lost more and more interest as mm-hmm. it went on because mm-hmm. what Hunt for October about, is about, it's fun. It's, it's, it's about honor. Mm-hmm. It's about problem solving. It's about, you know, being clever. Um, right. How do we manage to steal <laughs> a Soviet nuclear missile submarine right. Right. without the Soviets knowing we've taken it? Well, he's that's, defecting, right? I mean, that's is. I mean, yeah. I saw the movie. I didn't want. I didn't read. Oh, the, the movie's movie. great. Movie's yeah. fabulous. Yeah, I mean, Sean Connery. Is Sean like Connery a, is I mean, awesome, and Alec oh. Baldwin. What? I just wanted to mention there is only one actor, anyone, although the main actor in um, the Day of the Jackal is fantastic. I've never missed her, somebody Fox, like Michael, not Michael Fox, but like Jeffrey Fox or something is his yeah, name. Never heard of him again. Never. It just disappeared, but he was incredible and and like sort of a beautiful physical specimen. He was like not an ounce of fat on the guy and oh, yeah. super muscular, really physical performance and amazing, uh, really great acting. But uh then everybody else, y- you just don't know. I mean, because they're long time dead, but Derek Jacobi is in that. And what does he play? Derek Jacobi plays the assistant to the detective, the chief, chief inspector. That's right. And by the way, the chief detective, he's been in other things. In fact, I saw him just a couple of nights ago. He was the abbot of the monastery in wow. The Name of the Rose. Oh, oh. And in fact, he's been in a lot of films. I think a lot of them are French films. That's why mm-hmm. we don't know about him. But supposedly, like, he's a big, big, big actor in France. Um, but anyway, uh, Hunt for Red October. Hunt for, yeah. Hunt for, great movie. Fabulous movie of a fabulous book. But the great thing about the book is that it's fundamentally a really lighthearted book. There's no hatred. Hmm. There's uh, there's sort of this simmering revenge in the heart of uh, the captain, the Soviet submarine captain, but it's not a big deal. That's it doesn't define his life. It, he's just somebody who's going to make something happen. Um, but it, there's nothing grim about it. And then Tom Clancy started writing more books and became more about revenge mm-hmm. and disappointment and humiliation. They just got na- I just I never liked him. The great th- and I again one theme we keep returning to is why do we like the books that we like? And I I for me I've already said a lot of it's humor, but also a lot of it is about I, I don't want to hear about people's humiliation. You know, some traumatic thing that happened to them when they were nine and you know, and how that forces them to become a serial killer. I'm just, can we write a book that doesn't, I mean, I'm I'm sure that happens and I'm pegging this microphone out. I think, um, I'm, you know, I'm sure that happens, but can we write a book that doesn't have that? And you do, you have the hunt for Rod October, which is all about honor in, um, humility, um, the truth winning out. It's a good, it's a, it's a great book. It's a lot, a lot of fun. But then later on, he just sort of, became, you know, Tom's book started getting more and more morose and dark um, and I and and mean and violent. And I didn't like it. Um, yeah. So anyway, I don't know how. I, oh, you're talking about uh, White Hill, Chesapeake Bay. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So so that's we've got that on the on the radar. OK. Dead Rise. Dead got Rise. It. And yesterday I was absolutely tormented by that song that I had recommended to you. Uh, which song was the color that? Color of Noise. Oh, color of Noise. So I have this thing. I have this thing where I go, oh, I remember I sent somebody an email about that. And then I spend two and a half hours looking for the email and I never find it. <laughs> and it dry, I, I know I'm losing it. I'm getting older, so I'm going to have to lose it at some point. But I don't want it to be just right now. And yesterday, I tore the house up. I mean, metaphorically speaking, I tore the house apart for like an hour looking for that song. Wow. And the way I finally found it, the reason why I wasn't finding it was that I was searching on emails from Jim and Fantino. But in this case, the e- the emails back and forth with Jim Infantino. But in this case, it was emails back and forth with Slab Media. Uh, and noise was not spelled N-O-I-S-E. It was spelled N-O-I-Z-E. And that's why I wasn't finding it. Oh, okay. Okay. 
And so I finally found it, and it was a touchdown. It is one of life's little unsullied triumphs that I may be losing it, but not not today. No, I mean that's hard enough. I mean that it's. Uh, I think that's excusable. Yes, and so I, I'm never going to forget that song again. Derek Hodge, color of the color of noise, N O I Z E. I recommend that everybody listen to that tune. Okay, it's about five minutes long, and I think you listen to it too. And the great thing is that it's not really a song, um, but it's great. <laughs> it's, okay. it's really fun to listen to. So Maybe anyway. yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember it. So you know, I'll, I'll go back. And, it's just and like this maelstrom of of people playing. It's it's these. It, I think it's two drummers playing this incredibly fast beat. This mm-hmm. incredibly fast, very sync, a uh, very improv- improvisational beat. Um, and like just a whole bunch of musicians swirling around them playing these, there is a chord pattern. There is an overall chord pattern, but the, the rhythm at which they're playing bears no relationship, no discernible relationship Mm -hmm. to what the Mm -hmm. drums are doing. And it really feels like you're Dorothy inside the tornado inside right. the twister and stuff. And there's, here comes the guy with a B three and he just blows by you, you know, playing his <laughs> B three as he goes flying past your head. And oh, here comes the bassist and he goes flying past your head. And it's just a complete tornado of sound. And I find it really exhilarating because there's really no way you can tap your feet to it. Like huh. you, there's none of that. There is, there is nothing to hold on to. There are no grid lines at all in this music in any way whatsoever. And it's really kind of fun and, and sort of tying back to what I was saying before. It's like when you look at, like when you look at the trees blowing in yeah. the wind and there's no pattern to it, but mm. there's something immensely satisfying about it. There's something unbelievably organic and immensely satisfying watching 10,000 leaves flip up and down randomly, according to wind and air blowing across them. It's the same with this piece of music. It's just, it it makes sense, but not in any way that you're used to. So anyway, Derek Hodge, Color of Noise, N O I Z E. It's on. It's, it, go to YouTube and just right. watch it there. Yeah, I, w- I will check that out. So what else that is going really on? Good. What about your California law? Do you want to talk about something else? Yeah, that's uh, boy. I don't really even know where to begin with this. Um, so um, I sent you. I sent you the. I have to look up the the text of the bill. The bill, even the number of the bill, um, it is um, California AB 1757. And um, I don't even have the, I don't have the latest on it. Let me see if it's in the news. Um, All right. So no, there, it may, it may be passing. It says Cal, so the latest, uh, from yesterday, California assembly bill on website accessibility downgraded from potential lawsuit tsunami to 2024 weather watch. Uh, so this is new to me. I'm just reading it from jdsupra.com. Um, The synopsis is AB 1757, which would set a standard for website accessibility for businesses in California, Uh has been held in the legislature to resume discussion in 2024. This is uh, is good news. And this is a short article. I'm just going to read a bit of it. Um, While Southern California and Burning Man revelers were hit with unprecedented severe storms in August, the California legislature has given businesses at least a temporary reprieve from legislation that would likely have caused a tsunami of lawsuits on its own. As we reported, AB 1757 was seemingly well-intentioned to provide clarity around how websites must be coded to be considered accessible to individuals with disabilities and thus in compliance with the UNRWA UNRWA Act and the Disabled Persons Act, California's corollaries to the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. Yeah. However, as drafted, it had some serious shortcomings that may well have resulted in even greater litigation and liability for businesses that we've already seen and newly imposed liability on website and mobile app developers. So the, on August 21st, 2023, the bill was held in Senate Appropriations Committee at the request of the bill's author. While the storm has passed for now, we expect to see the bill's return in 2024 and hope revisions will be made to actually accomplish the bill's stated goal of reducing lawsuits while increasing accessibility and providing useful guidance to businesses. So the upshot, because I read the August version of the bill, and it just, I mean, if, if I had hair, it would stand on, on end. 
what it does. So ADA is law. You need to have your websites accessible. And um, gradually, I've, of course, been coding my website so that type can be made larger and, um, uh, and so that the page is readable and so that things are in a hierarchical uh, method. And recently, I've partnered with a, a third-party site called Accessibly that has a widget that costs quite a bit of money but solves all your accessibility problems um, under ADA. And just for people who don't understand that the, the uh, a website cannot just be uh, sort of um, useful only to people with all their senses. Um, if you have uh, a problem seeing, if you have a problem uh, with mobility, um, you have to be able to code a website in order to, that a person can tab through the buttons that they that it's labeled properly, um, so that a, a a sightless browser, a spoken browser, can tell you what's on the page. Otherwise, just like a building, it's not accessible um, to people with disability. So you know, to the best of my ability, I'm able to kind of code things. But once the user starts to add their own content. You know, they may leave the alt text off of an image, and then that might fail uh, an ADA test or what's WC, WCAG, WCAG. Right. Um, the California bill said all websites for any business in California need to be WCAG AA accessible, 2.1 mm. AA accessible. Yep. Or you can not only sue the business owner, you can sue the web designer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, they got a lot of money to yeah. go after. Um, and that means, and every website needs to be audited, not only automatically, not only using software like Accessibility will do, but by a competent accessibility consultant, hmm. a, a certified accessibility consultant. What, are there any thresholds on the businesses? Like you have to have at least 10 employees or more? I mean, no. what's the jurisdiction? Well, there was there was nothing in the bill about that. It was it was literally, and it was also unclear that it would only affect California businesses. I mean, every website is is viewable in California. So if your business is in Chicago, but your website is visible in California, can they go after you? That was sort of an open question. Um, and yeah, so I mean, uh, and also like you can't just rely on software to fix your problems. So it really made, it was like, first of all, just relying on software to fix your problems. For some people, you know, increasing your web hosting from, say, $29 a month to $99 a month in order to include the widget that will make the website fully accessible into WCAG, that might not work for a musician out of Arkansas uh, who just wants to have, tell people when their band is playing. Yeah, but you're not going to, nobody's going to sue that person. Yeah, except that if they do, they, under that, under the California law, they not only come after that person, they could come after me. And I have hundreds of sites up there. So that's hundreds of lawsuits potentially. Yeah. And all I have to, I just have to have faith that none of my clients are high profile enough for anybody to come after me. But that's, it's really, I, I contemplated, I'm like, oh, Time to, what do I do? I can drive an Uber. I can uh, work at Starbucks. I drive can do something driving. else. It's really cool. I have a truck. Well, this is one of those extraordinarily rare events on this podcast where this is a topic where I actually know something. Oh. Um, so um, I work for a university system, and I work not only for a university system, but also for a public university system. And this is a big topic with universities, mm -hmm. which is the accessibility of web pages. It's mm -hmm. a big deal. Accessibility in general is a big deal. Um, and there's a million directions in which this conversation can go. But what I can tell you is that really recently, the Department of Justice issued yet another dear colleague letter to all the university, I think many of the universities in America. Mm -hmm. Now, despite its warm and fuzzy sounding name, a dear colleague letter is not the letter you want to get. <laughs> a dear colleague letter is the DOJ saying, we've had it with you people. Wow. 
Um, and this is like, I don't think this is the first dear colleague letter they've sent. So the whole point is that if somebody violates the ADA, it's the Department of Justice that has to bring the lawsuit. The Department of Justice, basically, long story short, American universe, the, the there is much criticism to be leveled against American universities about the accessibility of their information resources, which mm-hmm. includes not only their websites, but their uh, other software that's used by universities, and even things like fax machines um, and ATMs and things like that. They, that should be accessible. And um, there have been many very high profile lawsuits brought against American universities for accessibility. Um, and I forget whether it's the American association of the blind or the American association of the deaf. I'm not sure, but one of those, um, there's definitely, you know, they're definitely serious about it. They're, right. they're, they're, they're getting plaintiffs, um, to bring cases and they're winning big awards. There's all you have to do is just look up accessibility lawsuit university, and you will get a fine list of many, many universities that have been walloped, um, over the past few decades right. over accessibility issues. And I've been directly involved with this as part of my job duties at some of the places I've worked. At, I've been involved with accessibility issues. Um, and there's many things I could say. I think the most important thing is that um, one thing I tell people is that the most important, th- well, it doesn't really impact what you're talking about, but when what gets people really unhappy is when they is when the student says, "Hey, professor, I can't I can't see this assignment you gave us because I I'm colorblind." Mm-hmm. So I can't mm-hmm. see this thing, and the yep, professor. Says, yeah, and the professor says, "Well, uh, take a take a different class then." Mm. Eh, wrong answer, wrong professor. Answer. Wrong yep. answer. So a lot of it is not technological. A lot of it is what we call administrative, which is the 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 from a university standpoint. And universities know this. The ev- all the universities I work with, they have uh, a disability coordinator, an accessibility coordinator, mm-hmm. which is great because you want a human being. If you're right. somebody with a disability and you encounter a problem, it's going to be a stressful, unhappy situation, and you don't want to be talking to a chat bot. <laughs> okay, yeah. you want a human being that you can talk to. And they all do, yeah. and they all have the coordinator. And then the, what the coordinator has to do is the coordinator. The second most important thing is to have a very good email address, a memorable email address or a website address. Because what you're going to do is you're going to pound that email address and that website address into the cranium of every living creature in the uni- every employee of the university. Right. And you're going to you're going to teach the faculty and staff if anybody comes up to you and mentions anything that could be remotely related to being a problem with disability, you you stop and you call me, or you refer that person to me. But get that person to me and let me handle it. Don't say something like, well, "Right, maybe maybe <laughs> anthropology is is not is not a good major for you." Wrong <laughs> answer. Wrong it. Just don't say yeah. anything. Just refer the student or refer the employee to me and let me handle it. And yeah, there's a couple of basic things. Um, contrast is a big issue. I mean, I tell people that 90% yeah. of accessibility can be put on a business card and kept in your wallet. And people have fought me on the tooth and nail. One, black text on a white background. Yep. Do not do not deviate from that unless you have a really good reason that you need to. Second off the bat, you can't indicate anything purely by the use of color. Right. That's the other big one. Perhaps the single most important thing in the world, don't use pictures at all. If you have to use a picture, the picture has to have alt text on it. And it has to be a description of the picture. Right. The alt yeah. text has to it can't, be meaningful. It can't just be like keyword stuffing or uh, this is all technical, but that's interesting. You know, I violate one of those. I violate one of those. I do not underline my links in, in my web designs because I, I think it looks awful. Yeah, but you have. You, but you kind of have to do that. You, you kind of because otherwise, or you have to. Yeah, yeah. Or some other indication. Yeah, there's some a indication font. that isn't. It's bold. Right, or, or, or bold. Whatever. Um, yeah, but it has to be yeah. something that's not related to color. It has to be something which is a, car- a shape change. 
Right. So it's that. And there's a lot of other differences. There's a lot of other things to watch out for. But that's 90% of it right there. I mean, the, right. the, the most important thing is that you have somebody who's going to talk to the student and say, okay, what's your problem? And, and how are we going to fix this? And well, then, there's, and there's yeah. also people people with epilepsy, right? I mean, you, you actually need to be very sensitive not to be creating like flashing graphics. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a ton of things like that. Right. Um, but the big ones are hearing impairment. And audio, uh, audio impairment, visual impairment. Those are the two. Those are the two giant ones. Absolutely, but the WCAG has been uh, has been evolving. So it's mm -hmm. it's not, um, you know, the the what was okay for accessibility five years ago is not okay yeah. anymore. Yeah. Um, so you need to stay on top of it. You do. Um, Slab Media uses a widget. You can check it out. Uh, Slabmedia.com. There's a little person. People have probably seen these things now. Um, you click on that, and then it changes. Uh, it changes the the view of the website depending on you know your personal preference. And of course, that widget is highly accessible, and it comes up first to a tab browser and things like that. Well, the fascinating thing, the thing that I find fascinating is the relationship. If I could, if I could summarize it in as small number of words as possible, it'd be we're all disabled. Yeah, because we've all benefited enormously from the changes that been, that have been spearheaded by disabled people. A lot of the features that we love most in the gadgets we use and the technology we use were originally designed to help people with disabilities, like backup cameras. Yeah. You know, yeah. if, you have, if you're mobility impaired, let's say you have a problem with your back and you can't turn around, you know, a backup camera is great, but a backup camera helps everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that, you know, on your keyboard, you can, you can just hit control plus and control, you know, zooming in and out now is so effortless. You know, you can just use gestures and just expand right. and contract things. Or even expanding the size of the text on a properly coded website. You can, yeah, yeah it's you can, tremendous. And yeah. all that stuff was done for people with disabilities and done for the elderly, which is, and but they benefit everybody. And they're so, you know, lit keyboards, um, yeah. all these things, everybody Everybody loves them, and so because sometimes you you meet up with resistance, and people are like, oh my, I gotta do this to my website because it's just for people well, with disabilities. It's like, dude, it helps everybody. Interestingly, I got started in web design because I read a book by a guy named Jeffrey Zeldman um, called "Designing with Web Standards" back in 1999, wow. um, or I may have read it in 2001. But he was the he worked on the w3.org. Uh, he really founded yeah. that with a number of other people, and they started creating standards. Because at the time, remember, Microsoft had a browser, and who Netscape had a browser. Those are the main ones. Mozilla was there a Mozilla br browser there's back then? Mozilla, I'm not sure. There's Netscape Communicator, and yeah. there is Internet Explorer. Right. They all had different rules in terms of how to interpret HTML. Oh. And Jeffrey was like, this is garbage. We, ne we need to have unified. Even uh, Microsoft was even launching their own form of JavaScript, which I forgot what they called, ActionScript or something like that. Uh, and it was Flash all over the web, which was completely standards free. And uh, Zeldman was like, no, here's how you code a web page. You separate the style sheet out from the content. Yep. Your content should have no code relating to appearance at all. No layout in your code. All the layout happens in the style sheet. And so th I, found that, I found that fascinating because at the time it was really like inventing the Gutenberg press. It was really inventing a completely new form of publishing information, literally. And here was a guy who was saying, here's, here are the standards. These are the standards we all need and here's why. Right. You know, the best practices, um, best practices. You can separate all your uh, action script out, your, your JavaScript out. You can separate all your style sheet out. And one thing for accessibility nobody seems to have done is kill the style sheet. Because if you kill a style sheet on a well-coded web page, there should be nothing but an outline of the content. Right now we have reader view, right? You can some websites or some apps you can click on reader view, and then it sort of has a style sheet that simplifies everything. But but in theory, if you just remove the style sheet from a page, you would have black and white black text on a white background in Times New Roman with all the links bright blue and underlined, and it would look like crap. Yep. But it would be very accessible. Yep. And I remember probably eight years ago, 
there was a company that we were talking to that that's what they did, which is uh, when people went to your website, if they clicked on the accessibility button, what this website, what this vendor would do was in real time, suck in all your code of your HTML pages and redisplay it wow. exactly like you said, which is Times New Roman, you yep. know, and everything, uh, everything in screen reader format, uh, yep. stuff like that. Um, yeah, well, it's, I mean, on a, on a well-coded website, it's, it's simple. There's usually, well, there's a series of, now, now there's like 82 different style sheets. And there, there's, there's the ones that are included from Font Awesome and from Google and from, you know, Google Fonts and all these others. So it's a little more complicated, but you could, in theory, rewrite the header on the fly to just kill the style sheets. I, anyway, who cares? But Well, I think, I think we all care because I think it's a fascinating, I think, you know, we talked, I, I think it's a fascinating topic, which is that this has been a long and painful dialogue that I've mm -hmm. been a part of. Um, and people have really fought this. Um, in my experience, people are sure. like, oh, I got to deal. Oh, we got to do this. Oh, yeah. Gonna, and Why I'm high like, contrast? High contrast? It's like, right? I mean, uh, I want really light, really thin, like Helvetica 100, which is yeah. like the thinnest hairline version of a typeface. Yeah. And I want it to be in kind of dark gray, gray on yeah. an A crew background. On an A crew. Seriously, I've got patterned to the point. background. I'm, I'm yeah. seriously, I yeah. mean, I'm seriously getting ready to write a letter to like the Atlassian. Because that expresses me. That's my inner style. That's who I am. Yeah. I, I yeah. Uh, you know, this vendor I work with all the time, Atlassian, I want to send him an email saying, do you guys know about excess? I I can't read. Yeah. I mean, I'm hitting sixty. Right, I, I am sixty. I'm 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 I got one foot firmly planted in, in the land of the disabled here, kids. Um, my eyes. I've had multiple operations on my eyes, um, and I'm finding this stuff really hard to see. Um, and so, uh, but anyway, back to the original thing, which is that I think it's a really interesting thing, which is that after a while, you just get used to it, and people adopt it. And yeah. they start building it in and they say, okay, yeah, we're going to naturally do that. Yeah. Let's not put pictures in here because we don't really need the pictures and it just causes, it just gets everybody unhappy. Um, and uh, as I said, I think it's just amazing how it's, it's, it has benefited everybody um, yeah. and made for better websites um, and also just all the features that have been designed. Uh, there's millions of them. Um, that also that also is a fascinating thing I love thinking about too, and I'll stop after this because I'm now I'm just free form ranting. <laughs> but I just love looking at a bicycle, like looking at a modern bicycle yeah. or a car. But a car is kind of complex. Bicycles a little easier. Look at a bicycle today, and then look at the bicycles that were being made in like 1900. Yeah, and you just realize that there are thousands of minute little improvements that make the modern bicycle so much more useful, durable, um, just so much better than a bicycle in 1910. I mean, the bicycle right. in 1910 was great, but the bicycle today is just absolutely fabulous. It's lighter, it's stronger, it's more maneuverable. You can do more things with it. Um, and uh, it's the same thing with all the technology with these websites, we just get better and better at it. And we make better websites and people fight against these things like accessibility standards, but they're actually pretty, and they probably fight against your guy doing his W3 standards too. But you know what? Well, they did. Yeah. Yeah. But, they, get but they, it was adopted. It was adopted. It was adopted. And then, and then things get better. And finally, I was so happy that Apple has been forced to put uh, a, a USB-C adapter on their right. phones. Yes. <laughs> Humble. <laughs> The giant has been humbled. You gotta, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to dress just like the rest of the great unwashed. You've got to mingle with with the rest of us proletarians, and you have to put this filthy US, this this filthy common USB C plug on on your gorgeous golden phone. But no, I'm not bitter. I'm not angry about it at all. Well, as as uh, our previous guest Chris Chandler has said in one of his songs, we are all only. We are all able-bodied temporarily. Yep. Yeah. Um, 
How's that for like a closing comment? Does that work? I think, yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, for the, not, for this if subject. it's a closing comment, you're not supposed to say stuff after it. That's oh, all. right. Yeah. <laughs> quiet. And see. <laughs> uh, well, I, um, yeah, I've, I've run. So, um, are there is a your, coda? Yes. Do you want a coda? Or yeah. Do you not want a coda? Hit, hit the coda. And this might get me into trouble, and we may have to snip this off. I, oh, okay. I may have to think about this, because I'm always very worried about talking about things having to do with work. Yeah. But what's interesting is the state of Texas has fairly well-developed rules regarding the accessibility of information resources and websites run by state agencies and state institutions of higher education. Mm-hmm. I can probably look at TAC 213. I'm not sure. I think that may be the project management, but whatever. It's TAC something or other. And one of the interesting ones is there's all these rules about the accessibility um, of your software and the accessibility and, and making sure that you buy accessible software. Mm. And this has caused tremendous tremendous arguments hmm because first off the bat no software is accessible if you the again it's the wcag and it's various there's various standards you use to judge the accessibility right. of software there used to be these things uh, now they're called acrs they used to be called vpats so if yeah. you were a software manufacturer, you did a voluntary, a voluntary product accessibility template, a VPAT, that mm -hmm. you filled out. You said, yeah, my stuff is accessible because of this. And I answer all these questions, and I add up all the numbers, and I'm either accessible or, or however much. And that was succeeded. That was superseded by the ACR, which is Accessibility Compliance Report or something like that. Right. But what it basically boils down to is that no software is 100% compliant. Right. Well – yeah, it there are problems. It, there are problems. It, there, I mean, try to picture a compliant version of the game Mist. Yeah. I mean, or really most games, like Bubble Pop. How do you make that accessible? Right. So the whole point is that what the, the, what the law says is that all the software purchased by Texas state agencies have to be accessible or they have to have an exception granted. Hmm. And the exception has to be signed by the president wow. of the institution or their designee. They finally got a designee in there. And what you realize when you read the bill and you read the history of it, and it's kind of stupid because first off the bat is if you want to buy base camp, okay, yeah. you know, is Asana any more accessible than Basecamp? Is Basecamp any more accessible than Asana versus Jira versus Monday.com versus right. this versus 150,000 other personal productivity and task management software? Who knows? They're all inaccessible. And usually you find that people just want to buy the program they want to buy. and They don't really care about your accessibility issue. Right. And right. in this case, they're probably right because probably every other program is equally inaccessible in some way, shape, or form. So you get into this vast Kafka-esque bureaucratic nightmare where, I mean, universities buy a lot of software. And the people yeah. inside universities buy a lot of software. I mean, faculty go out and buy all kinds of software all the time. So every day, probably two pieces of software are being bought by a university at least every day, two to three mm -hmm. pieces of software. Mm -hmm. And so you set this sort of charade, this empty bureaucratic nonsense where you tell people, you ask people, is your software accessible? And if it's not, why not? And if it's not accessible, what's your plan to address the accessibility problems? And people are like, what on earth are you talking about? I didn't write the software. Right. I'm buying it off the shelf. Right. And so the interesting thing is, is that... That's really where that, this particular law came from. Where these particular laws came from was from the big Texas state agencies like Youth uh, uh, Health and uh, DHS, Department of Health Service, or I forget, whatever. S these big state agencies 
that have to basically every citizen of the state has to interact with this agency at some point. So every citizen is going to go to the state agency's website and every citizen is going to interact with the software of the state agency at some point, like a DMV Mm -hmm. DMVs. That website is going to be used by every, (laughs) every able bodied adult of the state at some point, multiple times a year. Yeah. uh, If it's a DMV. And so, Many times the DMVs wrote their own software. They had these enormous databases that kept track of welfare benefits, that kept track of vehicles and drivers. And that's what the law was really about, because the people who were bringing lawsuits were, A, citizens of the state, disabled citizens of the state who couldn't make heads or tails of the lawsuit, and disabled employees of the agency who couldn't make heads or tails of the software, the back-end wow. software that was written to maintain all this data. And that's where the law came from. It was really about custom-crafted websites and custom-crafted software. It wasn't really meant to apply the situation where you say, I want to buy Calendly. Mm-hmm. I'm a faculty member, and I just want to buy Calendly because I want to keep my cal- – I, I want other people to be able to book meetings with me. You know, you know what? But really, there's no excuse for software like – web-based software like Calendly to not be accessible. Okay. A lot of these, a lot of these packages are just websites. True, they're web apps, and those can be made accessible. Absolutely, I, I was thinking you, you know, like Microsoft Word. Is it accessible? Probably by now, right? Is it? I don't know. No software is accessible. No, our experience has been because I think the the I think I think it's it's an issue with the standards themselves that they are either A, so stringent, or B, a combination of stringent and poorly defined. Like, you don't, you're not really sure what they're talking about. Yeah, yeah. But the general, the general feeling is that whenever, whenever people do get an ACR or VPAT done, you never get a full compliance score. It never happens. Yeah. And so you get into, these, you get into this Kafka-esque bureaucratic nightmare where people are having to fill out reams of paperwork when all they want to do is buy a copy of uh, Snag It. <laughs> you know, they, right, want to, they right. want to buy some, and they're like, yeah. why am I filling this? This is total nonsense. Why am I filling this crap out? Right. I can't make it, I can't make it compliant. I can't make it accessible. Right. right. And, it's, and, it, and it's functionality I need. Yeah. And it's functionality I need. And every other thing, even if I was willing to use a competitive product, they're inaccessible too. So mm-hmm. what's this all about? And so, you know, what you eventually get to is a regime where you just immediately generate an exception request. As soon as somebody submits a request, because the law was really written for a different universe. It was written for a different thing, but somehow it would, the law was written such that it applied to all software, when really what it was meant to address was custom-coded software. And everybody agrees that websites are the main that's the main thing because websites well, yeah, are I mean, custom coded. Yeah, it's the lowest. I mean, the, truthfully, it, yeah, it's it's the lowest bar. And let me just brag on myself for a minute. I I partner with this company, Accessibility, that you can you can run audits on all the sites that I have. Um, and what I was finding was, uh, you know, I I was convincing my clients to buy to purchase X number of hundred dollars a year to have the widget to have like to just be double safe. And I think so far I have, I have one client that's taken this on. Because when I run the audit, I do come out compliant because I have been coding and I've been keeping up. Yeah. Um, yeah, you build it. But that's not the, true of yeah. every site because some of the sites I haven't touched in, you know, they're just, I designed them in 2014. Right. You know, and accessibility just wasn't talked about. It wasn't, it wasn't part of the standards discussion. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I've, been, I've been doing my part, but. You know, to be compliant means WCAG 2.1, I don't know what level after that, right? There's A, AA, and AAA. AAA. I haven't been paying attention to which one of those. I, it says compliant, I'm compliant, right? So this California law was really going to be like, nope, you've got to be AA compliant. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty high bar. And all that takes is your user, you know, your client just uploading the image and clicking save. But going back Without to the original thing, the description. but going yeah. back to re- many, many times, politics is, I don't, I don't want to say it's theater, but it's negotiation. Like many times people propose bills with the full knowledge that the bill will probably not pass, 
but they're trying to send a message. They're trying to make a statement. It's they're signaling. And right. so same with the DOJ, the DOJ, again, like I said before, sent out this dear colleague letter and they said, you know, Hey, universities, we've been talking about this shit for like 20 years. Oh yeah. When are you guys going to get it together? Because we're constantly being approached by people with disabilities saying, oh, we yeah. got to I mean, sue your asses. And you know what? They're right. Because yeah. when we actually do bring the lawsuits and we actually do do the investigation, the behavior is so, you know, you guys are just falling down. You're not handling this correctly. Yep. You know, there are standards here. And yeah, sometimes it's really egregious. Like, you know, these people are just shunted around. They're ignored. Um, and man, just if you want to get create a pissed off plaintiff, just do that. Just like don't answer their f- phone calls and don't don't deal with it. Um, and so, um, so I think maybe what California is trying to do with this bill is say, yeah, you know what? The D- Department of Justice has a point. You guys got to get your act together. We're yep. sick and tired of getting calls from disabled people saying they're getting screwed by you. And you know what? They are. Yeah. And we don't have the time to bring your stupid little lawsuits because we're busy trying to take care of more important things in this state. So why don't you just get your act together and start doing accessible uh, resources from the get go. And that's how the dialogue goes. Yeah. So, anyway. So you let, let's sit on this for a couple of days and see if you think it's worth including, but I don't think I, I said anything that's terribly. No, uh, no, I think I, th- I thought, I thought it was good. And for once we were talking about something important <laughs> yeah, or something, <laughs> something that, you know, I deal with on a daily basis. Oh yeah. But I also, it's, it is pertinent and, and it is important. I mean, the web is. is how we get so much information. And if you're cutting out 20% of the population because they're colorblind or they can't see, or they have epilepsy, or they have cognitive, you know, disabilities of any kind. Uh, you're, it's just, or mobility issues. That's the other, you know. Sure. Think about a veteran coming back with, it's got, you know, just can't use a mouse, right? And you haven't made, you haven't designed your software or your or your website to to be accessible to that person, right? It's just wrong, you know. Yeah. So, uh, it is. Yeah, it is. It's an important topic. And here's the, here's here's one last part of it, which is I said accessibility benefits everybody because mm-hmm. we all use these accessibility features and they're great for everybody. But yeah. The more important thing, but that's it's even more broad than that, which is that organizations need to be able to listen to their people. Organizations need to be able to hear the complaints of their stakeholders. And this is an important thing in a university. A university, it's a weird kind of organization. It's, you know, I don't want to get too profit driven, but also. Well, it's it's even weirder than that. It's it's like a little mini city and it's all these shifting populations. It's people coming and going. Um, Mm -hmm. But the key thing is you got to listen to these people. And how well are you listening to them? And how well are you how well are you getting information to them that they need? And how well uh, are you processing um, problems and complaints? And it's hard to do. It's hard to do because um, that's what I do all day. I mean, that's what we all uh, what a lot of people in universities do is we 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 people come to us with problems. Hey, I tried to go to the, I tried to click on that thing you told me to click on. It's not working. Oh, here we go again. Or, right. you know, the student says, hey, you know, I, I tried to submit my paper, but it didn't work. And da, 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 da. Hey, uh, I was supposed to get this financial aid, um, but it hasn't appeared. What do I need to do next? You know, the mark of a good institution is how effectively it processes those. Um, and to a certain degree, the the accessibility the disabled are like a canary in a coal mine because if you see you know uh, if if a disabled person <laughs> brings a lawsuit against your university backed by the American Society for the Deaf or whatever yeah. it's, first off the bat it's going to get your undivided attention and right. it does and second off the bat that's a bellwether it's a bellwether for your entire institution okay how did we do by this person. And if we if we didn't do well by this person, 
What about everybody else? Disabled or otherwise, are we, how well are we at the fundamental task of listening to people and solving their problems? And the answer usually is not very well, or certainly there's room for improvement. Maybe, maybe we're all challenged, but the first step is to know how challenged you are. Yeah. And sometimes institutions don't even know. They don't even know how, you know, how disconnected things are. And that's why I think the the disability lawsuits sometimes are really good because they really force the it's like an electric jolt to the institutions that no, you've got to pay attention. This person had a complaint. They went through the they 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 made reasonable efforts to make their complaint heard and they got screwed. Yep. And so if it happened to them, how many other people is it happening to? And what, how are you going to fix this? Uh, interesting. I mean, you know, I have not been posting transcripts for all of our podcasts. But I'm totally going to be posting a transcript for this one. For this one, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, sorry about that yeah. long-winded thing. But I think it's, again, to a certain degree, we, are, we all benefit from the efforts of the disabled. Yeah. And the trials and tribulations they go through, they, they benefit everybody. It'd be better if they didn't have to go through the trials and tribulations to begin with. But if you're gonna if you're gonna have a whole bunch of lemons, might as well make lemonade. Anyway, I liked your I liked your closing thing about we're all disabled we're we're all disabled we're all only, we're, we're we're only temporarily able bodied temporarily. <laughs> Chris Chandler. <laughs> that man, that man. That man. Okay. All right, Lionel. Okay, James. Um, I will see you next week. Okay. See you there. The Funny Not Funny podcast is produced by me, Jim Infantino. This clip from the album Utopia Revisited. We are found wherever podcasts are found. Visit our website at funnynotfunny.bigego.com. Please tell your friends and leave a rating or review.